going back to food, you, you mentioned, you know, the, the romantic notion that many people have that, you know, our ancestors used to, before that, before they were contaminated by modernity, human beings used to eat the diet. And what's kind of funny about this is there's different camps of people who have different views on what the diet is. Diet. <laughs> Um, you know, there's the raw food thing that we shouldn't be cooking things because cooking came later and it's not the original way we're supposed to eat food. There's the literal paleo diet where I'm, I'm not sure how literal some of those people get, but the idea is paleolithic humans were eating a diet and because that's what they were eating and that's who we evolved from, that must be the best diet. So something high in fat and protein and low in carbs is what you should be eating. Can you comment on some of those diet trends and just the general notion that there is a optimal diet for people? Yeah. Um, well, one of one of the errors in the thinking, and you know, many of these diets actually have some some value in them for some people, um, but paleo diet in particular, just it's easy to pick on it because of the name and it, it does, you know, a low carb, high protein, high fat diet will work for some people quite well, not all people. Um, the name makes the error of imagining that there is one moment in our past to which we are notably and singularly evolved and adapted to, and that we have done no changing since then. And we are monolithic. And of course, neither of those things is true. Humans, you know, continue to evolve, and there is no moment in the past to which we are singularly adapted. So we refer in the book not to the standard environment of evolutionary adaptedness, which is a term of art in evolution, but to our environments of evolutionary adaptedness, right? So yeah, the savanna of the Paleolithic is a moment that our hunter-gatherer ancestors uh, existed in and uh, to which we have some adaptations. Um, but there were also at the same time people living along coastlines and 10, 12,000 years ago, most humans um, whose descendants are alive today discovered convergently across many places on the earth agriculture. So we are also adapted to an agricultural diet and lifestyle. And long, 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 long before that, um, all humans, all human, all modern human cultures, all, all human cultures that have been looked at by anthropologists um, have had fire. And so we've been, we've had fire and we've been cooking food, it seems, um, for a very, very long time indeed. So the idea that a raw diet is the best for us, no, it's not. And in fact, many of the people eating raw diets are undernourished um, because one of the things that cooking food does for us is it allows us to extract more nutrition from that food. Um, yeah, maybe that's that's it just for now. Yeah, I, I think... Um there are a few principles that are probably worth uh, thinking about. Heather and I have been talking on our podcast about the importance of supply chain length of food. This is sort of a hidden parameter in, uh, in food, and it may just be a proxy, but to the extent that your food has had to endure travel over very long distances, um, it has probably been stabilized or bred into a form that is optimized for that rather than your health. And so there's something to be said for an obsession with, uh, you know, locally grown food. Does it have anything to do with your locale? Maybe not. But if the food was grown locally and got to you immediately, um, there's a good chance that actually it's less stable. And therefore, if you get it quickly, better for you. Yeah. Terroir is real. You know, this French concept that's usually invoked with regard to wine, you know, exactly what was the soil of the um, of the vineyards where the grapes that the wine was made from were grown and how does that affect the flavor of the wine? So in that in that context, it seems like it might just be frivolous, but terroir is real and the particular soil, you know, health makeup, uh, microbiome, if you will, um, is going to be particular to individual places. And, um, you know, you want the healthiest, the healthiest soil possible. Um, I guess to your original point about, you know, will there be a best diet for all humans, which is the question that we, I think, start the food chapter with. Um, no, of, of course not. And just, you know, to make it, to make it obvious, think about people who have a, the longest history in the Arctic, the Inuit, as opposed to people who have a history in, um, you know, in the, in the increasingly desertified sub-Saharan Africa. So say the Maasai, uh, there are, they have very different diets 
And that exists because of what was available to them and the climate that they were dealing with. Uh, but imagining that, you know, a paleo diet, a, a paleo diet that is uh, low in carbs and high in fat and protein is equally appropriate for an Inuit for whom that diet is probably quite native already. And Maasai uh, is misunderstanding how variable and diverse human physiology, anatomy, and experience are. So is the general direction that's appropriate here, the move towards personalized diet, dieting and, and medicine? I'm seeing a lot of products and services out there, and I'm not sure how good all of them are. But in general, is it better to think about it things that way, that instead of a diet that is the best for everyone, we should we should look at what our own biology is saying, potentially by taking a cheek swab or getting a genome sequence or whatever, and using whatever we can ascertain from that to determine an optimal diet for me as an individual. Is that, is that the right direction? Because that is, that is the direction we do seem to be moving. Probably, probably not. Yeah. Um, maybe eventually, but it's, it's like the appendix, right? The recognition that it's got to be for something is a long way ahead of figuring out what it's for. And in this case, Ultimately, we might be able to figure out how to tailor things to you. There are probably things that we can do that about already. But in general, it's probably much more useful to follow the kind of logic that Michael Pollan uh, deploys, where you know he uses various rubrics, shop the outside of the supermarket because that's where the fresh food is. Don't eat things that your grandmother wouldn't recognize. I would add- As, as food. Yeah. Right. I would add to his list, I think- um, a coherent diet is probably more important than a tailored diet. In other words, one of the things that we've done uh, as uh, modern Western cosmopolitan folks is we've got such a wide variety of things that you might eat. And we think mostly in terms of what do I want to eat now, rather than thinking about, well, if I teleport myself back 500 years and I tune into any of those diets that I would have found eaten, you can say by definition, it contains everything you need, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't have that, right? We don't have coherent diets. And so reassembling something that is inherently complete in some regard is probably more important than the tailoring. That said, if you come from a population whose ancestral diet was very different than uh, the main, the average diet of, of humans across the world, there may be things to which you are particularly susceptible deficiencies that you will need to, to, to match. But um, by and large, a coherent diet that hasn't been heavily modified by long supply chains or something like that is probably number one. And then to the extent that you have deficiencies that are left because of the difference between the coherent diet that you've picked and your ancestry, then you might need to supplement in one way or another to get there. And supplement doesn't mean a pill. It could mean add a food to a consistent, uh, to a coherent diet. But, you know, somehow, somehow that's probably the rubric. And if a hundred years from now, we know enough about your genes to read them and say, you know, you need a little bit more of this and a little bit less of that. Um, so be it. But we're not there. We're not That's, there. It's it's effectively genetics snake oil salesman at this point, whether or not um, people know it. But we just we're not we're not there yet, and so it's in further service of reductionism, rather than actually mostly helping people get healthier. And I guess the <clears throat> the translation for shop the edges of the supermarket, uh, which again is Michael Pollan's uh, observation and suggestion, is um, eat food that you can recognize with regard to the organism it came from. And that doesn't mean don't create you know, stews or baked goods or such, but um, at, the point, at the point that you really can't figure out whether or not this food grew or was created in a lab, um, there's a good chance it was created in the lab and avoiding that as much as possible. Um, not because all of the things that are created in labs are bad for you, they're certainly not, uh, but uh, a carrot, you know, j just like, marijuana is going to give you a more complete experience than uh, just taking the separated out THC molecule. Uh, eating, eating a salad will give you the more complete experience than taking the multivitamin that is supposed to replace that salad.